Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome come you to this webinar, Tips and Tricks on Successful Visual Field Interpretation, presented by Monica Fischer later on. My name is Rainer Hermann. I'm the Marketing Head and Sales Director of Hagstreit Diagnostics and, uh, and responsible for the uh, international business. Today, I will be the moderator for this webinar. To do so, I would click, uh, quickly guide you through some organizational information about this webinar. First, um, we will have, after the presentation, a question and answer session. To pose questions to the presenter or to the Hogstrike team, please use the question and answer button in the Zoom bar. You should find it marked by Q and A or in your language, whatever question and answer means. Please do not use the chat functionality. The chat is for other information for exchange. Uh, questions would be good to receive them through, through questions and answers. If you would like to contact Hark Stride directly for some more information for quotes or anything, please use the link that we will send in the live chat. With this link, you get to a form where you can pose your questions or um, your activity. Then just for your note, this meeting is recorded. Um, it is an information to you. We will not disclose any of your proprietary information to the public. So um, that should not be an issue, but just to inform you that we do record and broadcast the video later on. So this is for the introduction information. If, you, this, if this webinar sparks off some interest for more information on octopus or on perimetry, there's much more resources available. Um, one is the focus months that we have right now. This actually is the first webinar of this series and there is much more to come. So please check out um, our perimetry focus months and um, the events that we broadcast there. The link is available also in the chat. Then if you have um, more, more need for learning or information, there is a really nice tool, our e-learning platform for the visual field digest with all the information uh, condensed into, in an interactive form. And last not least, um, there is also a book available, a textbook, uh, the Visual Field Digest as a PDF for download from our website, which has a lot of this relevant information in there. Now, before we start with our presentation, we would like to do a very short poll with one question only, where we would like to ask you, which brand of perimeter are you using today? Um, I ask the team to present these Paul, and then we should give you a short time to answer the question and please do so and so that we get a short e overview. I see the question is now there. So please give it a couple of seconds to answer the question. Yes, great, thank you. There is questions coming in or answers coming in. So thank you very much for this information. It's well received. Now, as I said, this is the first webinar of a series of webinars in our Perimetry Focus Month. And I do have now the pleasure to introduce Monica Fischer to you, who will be the presenter today. Monica Fischer is a senior, a senior market manager Perimetry at Hagstreit Diagnostics and one of the authors of the Visual Field Digest, the book I just mentioned. 
which is a textbook uh, called A Guide to Perimetry and the Octopus Perimeter, Perimeter, which now is in the eighth edition and has a great distribution globally. Monica is the visual field expert at Hogstride Diagnostics, and she is responsible for all the market and customer oriented information uh, in visual fields globally. To do that, she has a very good background. She is Master of Science in Biotechnology from the Swiss Federal Institute of Science and Technology. And she has a Master of Advanced Studies in Market Management from the University of Basel. Prior to joining Hagstreit Diagnostics more than seven years ago, Monica worked in product management, in traumatology, and in dentistry. And since then, she has been um, speaker in a number of occasions about visual field and about perimetry in general. And I'm now happy to open the platform for Monica Fischer to give her presentation on visual field interpretation. Thank you, Monica. So a very warm welcome from my side as well. It's a pleasure to see so many people here today joining us. Um, what we're going to go through in the next hour are, as, as Rainer said, tips and tricks for successful visual field interpretation. And this presentation is really based on the Visual Field Digest book. So if you want to get more details on any of the points, um, the book offers a wealth of information on all the points covered. So I can really encourage you to read this or at least read the parts that you're interested in. It's 300 pages, so I don't expect you to read all. Um, what are we going to go through today? So first, we revisit common representations are well known, but there's still some tricky parts I find that are often missed. Um, then we look at useful tools, the cluster and polar analysis that are really helpful in borderline cases. And um, the second half of the talk is going to be dedicated to how you can be fast and effective with using progression analysis. So let's start get started right away. Um, what I find when it comes to visual field interpretation uh, is definitely not always a downhill road. And I find a systematic approach to doing visual field interpretations, especially when you start, can really help you. And there are four essential steps to this. So first of all, and that's really key, always ask yourself whether you can trust the visual field. Uh, visual field testing is a subjective test. Patients are not always performing reliably. If they don't, there's really no diagnostic medical value in the visual field. Second question, um, is the visual field normal or abnormal? We get to that why this is not so easy or not always so easy. And only once you establish this an abnormal field, you can look at what kind of disease could it be and how severe is this to then think of what intervention you could do. So let's get started with reliability. Um, a kind of no-brainer, but always good to remember is, of course, that you have the correct patient and examination parameters. Um, age is one of them. You see here an example of what happens when age is incorrectly entered, as we have age-related um, normative databases. Um, but what I find practically happens the most often um, or goes wrong is if you have incorrect um, refractive refraction. Um, and then the patient doesn't see it clearly and you get a diffuse, artifactual diffuse loss. So that's something to really pay attention to. Um, but it's so much more, um, ask yourself really, to, is the visual field reliable, free of artifacts and trustworthy? Um, and a couple of things you can check. I think we all know the false positive and negative answers that any device has. Um, I've seen there's been quite a number of users not familiar with the octopus, so I mean, False positive negatives, I think that's common in every perimeter, so I won't go there any further. But what I find is um, sometimes they're down to zero. So you would think this is all reliable, but in reality it's actually not. And there's so much more clues, for example, really watch out for edge and rim artifacts, lid artifacts. Um, you see a couple of examples here, these really dark edges um, because they may be art purely artifactual. Um, here's one I find really important, and that's not always um, paid so much attention to, is the consistency with other 
diagnostic tests. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, observations of the visual field examiner can actually be really helpful. You know, if a patient's fidgeting around during the test, blinking 200 times, most likely patient's not comfortable and that's going to somehow show in the test. And last but not least, the defect curve, which I'll get to later, can also give you clues about reliability. So one thing I find really important that is not sometimes missed is the consistency of tests. Visual deals, field defects, real defects, real ones, they stay at the same location in repeated testing, um, for very few exceptions. And they have a shape typical for a pathology and other diagnostic methods will confirm that pathology. So what you see here is a kind of a nasal arc, a step kind of developing arcuate defect. Um, you know, it's not perfectly consistent, um, but fairly consistent. So that I would call it consistent series. Whereas when you have a look at these examples here, uh, they're inconsistent. The tests are not repeatable. Um, they're getting from better to worse to whatever. On the top, you see a learning effect. The first time a patient ever takes a visual field test, they may perform worse than in follow-up tests. Um, on the bottom, you see rim artifacts. They're not repeatable, but they just happen every now and then. So if you're unsure about visual field reliability, it's always good to repeat the test once more. Um, and then there's one more thing to really pay attention to, um, and that's diffuse loss. And let's explain me what this is and why. So diffuse loss or widespread loss is what you see on the top, a uniform kind of diffuse defect everywhere, whereas a local defect would be just local at some locations of the visual field, but not everywhere. And why is this relevant? So of course, there are pathologies affecting the anterior jamber, um, most common one being cataract, also coronary opacities. Um, they, they lead to these diffuse defect patterns. Um, not that you would do perimetry for those patients to diagnose the diseases, but they, of course, may have um, two or more um, diseases and then affects your visual field. The reason why diffuse loss is so interesting is um, it, it's also often a result of an unreliable test incorrect diffraction, incorrect patient age, too small pupil, learning effect, distraction, fixation loss, fatigue, all these things lead to diffuse loss as we've shown in numerous, numerous clinical studies. Um, and the diseases that we typically wanna follow up with um, visual field testing, most commonly of course glaucoma, um, they typically show a local defect pattern and not a diffuse one. Of course, there's also unreliable artifacts, lens, lens rim artifacts and lid artifacts that are local, but they have various characteristic shapes. So, so really, if you see a diffuse loss, ask yourself, does this relate to any pathology that I see in this patient? Because if not, this is actually quite a strong sign of an unreliable field or a less reliable field, to be honest. Um, and there's a really easy tool um, to identify it, it's in the octopus, um, it's the defect curve. The defect curve is very quick to read. You can read this in a second. Um, it's based on a comparisons chart or in the Humphrey terminology, total deviation chart. And it just takes all the defect sizes independent of location and ranks them in order of magnitude. So the smallest on the left, the largest on the right. Um, so how is that helpful? Um, it's actually very helpful because uh, it's very simple to read. Um, a normal visual field has a defect curve in that normal band. And this is how a diffuse loss looks like, this characteristic downward shift. Um, that's how a local loss, look, loss looks like, just a drop on the right-hand side. And there's, of course, a combination of diffuse and local loss. Um, and what the defect curve is really helpful for, it kind of immediately draws your attention to, hey, there's a defect, and why is it there? And if you don't find a clinical reason for it, clear sign of an unreliable field. So here again, what to watch out for, um, either this parallel shift or this parallel shift on the left and then drop on the right is characteristic of a diffuse loss. 
And this is another thing you can find out with the defect curve and that's tricky happy patients. Patients with abnormally high sensitivities because they left overshoot on the left. They have just these responses that don't happen in normals because they're just click and click. It's a really useful tool, very quick to use. Um, so, and that's all we have uh, for visual field reliability, but it's way more than just the false positives and negatives. So now let's move on to the second question. Is the visual field normal or not? And we know the probabilities representations that exist in every parameter um, using these kind of probability symbols um, with P larger 5% means this location is likely normal, whereas smaller P values um, suggest a potentially abnormal location. Now, when is it useful, the probabilities? Um, I mean, if a visual field is totally normal, you don't need to look at it. And if it's clearly abnormal, like the cases on the right, um, there's also no value really in looking at it, unless you want to look at the progression of a certain point that's been still for, fairly normal. Where it gets interesting and was really helpful is the borderline cases, because there things are not so clear. Um, and here's the rule of thumb on how to interpret that. Um, who has never made a mistake in their life? Well, I guess, I mean, I have made tons of them and so do our patients when they do visual field testing. Um, so just abnormal responses two, four times um, in a test, randomly somewhere in the visual field, that just happens. We all make mistakes. But if they start clustering together, uh, that's really not just due to chance. Um, that's probably something. And that's the kind of rule how we interpret these. So don't go for one abnormal, potentially abnormal location. Um, and it's really, this. these examples here show you how the grayscale is not really helping you in these borderline cases. Um, it's, uh, you, you see these cases, there's a bit, a little bit of yellow in the octopus where we use a color scale and the white represents to an oct totally normal visual field and black would be a total vision loss. Um, but you see on the probabilities that is randomly dispersed abnormal locations, no kind of pattern or cluster. So this we would call normal visual fields. And now look at the, again, at the grayscale of these normal visual fields and compare it to these which are actually abnormal visual fields, look pretty similar, right? Um, but then when you look at the probabilities representation, you see these characteristic clusters for glaucoma um, that we all know to look for. And that's really done helping you to say, okay, I think this visual field is abnormal. I mean, there's no clear cut agreed boundary for where exactly that is, but this is the kind of rule of thumb um, how to work with days. So don't enter over interpret just one abnormal location. Um, something we've just introduced uh, very recently with the latest ISPD 9 6.6 um, software update um, are a couple of features, um, classifiers for normality. So the first one is the glaucoma cluster test, the GCAT. And for those of you who are working with a Humphrey perimeter, um, that's the octopus equivalent of the glaucoma hemifield test, um, with the exception that it's based on octopus clusters, um, which I'll show you later, instead of the traditional hemifields used in the Humphrey perimeter. Um, you get, and this glaucoma hemifield test, it's, it's based on differences, significant differences between a superior and inferior visual field cluster. Um, is quite sensitive um, and specific to detect, to distinguish between normal and abnormal visual fields related to glaucoma. And you get these five text outputs within normal limits, borderline, outside normal limits, general reduction of sensitivity, which would be a use lo uh, diffuse loss, or abnormally high sensitivity, which would be related to a tricky happy patient and typically quite high false positives. But in addition to that, we've introduced further staging systems. Um, so the Brasini glaucoma staging system's also been around since 2006. 
it's a system that's based on the mean defect or mean deviation and the SLV or PSD. Um, where you have this chart and you put the MD there and the SLV or PSD, and you find a point and you get um, different stages of glaucoma. And the last one you may be familiar with as well is the Hodder Parish Anderson classification. Um, this just has three stages instead of um, the much much smaller scale used on the Prusini. Um, and this is the most commonly used staging system used for clinical studies. So now the question is, why do we have three? Why not one? Um, because the question of normality is a difficult one and there's no clear cut truth. Um, all of these indices have their merits. Um, and they, but their calculations differ and some perform better in certain cases than other. Um, so we show you all um, in the software or on the printout if you have the latest version. Um, and then if they agree, it really gives you a clear sense, okay, this is normal or this is abnormal. And if you get border, border, um, yeah, maybe that's just what it is. Maybe it's just a borderline case and other diagnostic methods need to help you to make a diagnosis. So now we've covered the difficult part and now let's move to a very simple one, grayscales or comparisons. Uh, or um, comparisons is the equivalent to the total deviation on a Humphrey printout. Uh, it just shows us the loss either in number or in, in a color scale. Um, and I mean, I don't think I need to say much about this. I think that's all well known, except for one thing. Um, don't interpret something into that's not there. We have on the standard test pattern on the octopus, the G59 test locations on on a 24-2, we have 54, so kind of same number. Um, and what you see on the right is the res resolution you actually have. That's these 54, 59 locations. That's on the left, it's just a pure beautifying uh, interpolation. So don't look for one pixel changes because they're really not real. It's just the al interpolation algorithm doing something different. The thing on the right is the real measurement. Just bear that in mind when you look at this. But else, I think it's a great tool, very quick to read. It gives you immediate sense of where you are, um, where the patient is. Patients, you can also use this for patient education. I think that's quite helpful. And then once you kind of know, okay, there is a disease and that's the shape. Um, when you think about interventions, of course, um, the severity of the disease has helped um, kind of stages and know where it is. So that's what the benefit of a mean defect, the mean deviation in the Humphrey world. Um, that's just an average of all the defect points. Um, note that in the octopus world, the mean defect is a positive number. In the Humphrey world, it's a negative number. Um, because, you know, it's based on how you calculate a defect. The defect is always a delta between a normal value and um, a measured value. So you either measure, calculate normal minus measured, then you end up positive, which is on the octopus, or you, measure, you kind of calculate measured minus normal, then you end up with a negative number, but it's really comparable. And the last index quite well known um, is the SLV or the PSD, which is the same. Um, the reason why we use this is that the MD as an average is really not enough to characterize a visual field. These two visual fields have very comparable MDs of 6.3 and 6.5, but they're fundamentally different, right? So what is the SLV or PSD doing? It's the standard deviation. If you're maths hero, it's the standard deviation of the MD. If you're not, um, it's kind of saying, how much do the individual defects differ from the mean defect? So kind of how much do the individual points spread out? You know, is it a large spread or a small spread? And if you have um, a large spread, that's more a diffuse, um, then it's a local defect. If you have a small spread, it's a, um, and the SLV is small, it's a, def um, it's a diffuse loss. Um, so small diffuse loss, large, um, local defect. Um, it, it kind of um, gets goes the other way around towards end-stage disease because a blind patient in essence has a diffuse loss, so it's totally blind. So that rule of thumb is more 
important for the early to moderate disease. So let me just sum up this first part. Um, can you trust the visual field? Is it normal or abnormal? And then ask yourself what kind of disease it could be and how bad is it? Um, these are the kind of basic steps to get through visual field interpretation that I find helpful. Now, things are not always so easy. The hardest visual field interpretations are really these borderline glycoma cases. And of course, cases with two or three um, comorbidities are maybe hard as well. Um, so I'd like to present to you a couple of uh, features we have uniquely in the octopus that really help you there. One is the cluster analysis. So what does the cluster analysis do? It starts with the comparisons chart or the total deviation. And then it creates 10 visual field clusters, you know, following the anatomical relationship of the nerve fibers. So this is a glaucoma analysis. And it makes a cluster mean defect or cluster mean deviation. And then you get that average. And then like under probabilities, it gives you normal clusters with a plus or abnormal ones with a number. The number is that cluster mean defect or mean deviation. In newer software versions, we use color code. Um, so orange and red is um, increasingly likely abnormal clusters. Now, so why do we have the why one more, right? We already have a lot of visual field representations. Well, it's actually been shown that the cluster analysis is highly sensitive to detect glaucoma. It's actually more sensitive than just looking at single points like the probabilities. You know, when you look at this case here on the left, right? I mean, in the middle probabilities, there's two points. Okay, they're close together, it could be paracentral. There's only two very mild abnormality. You may not be sure, right? But then when you look at the cluster analysis, it becomes clear cut, totally abnormal cluster. And that's just because a lot of these locations here, um, you know, they're just below this normality range because normal ranges are quite big for individual points because of all that fluctuation. Um, and the cluster, the cluster is really kind of summing, you know, it's kind of making an average that gets rid of, rid of all these random noises, but it's still a local average and not just something like an MD, which is kind of too broad for glaucoma in most cases. And how do you read that? I mean, yeah, if you suspect glaucoma, cases borderline, look at the cluster analysis, it shows a significant cluster defect you're much more likely to have glaucoma. On the other hand, if the cluster analysis doesn't show anything, it's probably not there. Then if, when it comes to structure and function analysis, we have a second very helpful tool, that's the polar analysis. Let me show you how that works. It allows you very easily to link to structural results. So you start with the comparisons or total deviation. And then you project these defects along the retinal nerve fiber layers, fibers onto the optic disc, because of course we know the anatomical relationship, right? And then you draw these lines and the lar longer the line, the larger the defect, and you flip the result so it looks like structural fundus or OCD or whatever you're using result. And then, you know, these red lines, you know, when they're really coming out, this kind of tells you, hey, look here for structural defect. Because, you know, that's, it's kind of linking the visual field result to the stru structural result. And I know a lot of people are unfamiliar with that kind of view. Um, so we kind of worked on it and came up with a adapted representation that's fairly, as brand new, um, just part of the iSuite i96 software. It's the optic nerve head or ONH projection analysis. Um, it's the kind of marriage between a cluster and the polar analysis. So you take the cluster analysis or actually the correct the cluster analysis or the pattern deviation of cluster analysis, which is correct for diffuse loss. And you take that cluster and you see how how all these points in there 
correspond to a certain sector in the polar analysis. And then you draw a sector map similar to what you have in the OCT. It's the optic nerve head projection analysis. Apologize, I have a little bit of um, a dry throat um, with winter in Switzerland. Um, I need to drink sometimes something, so I'll also start coughing. Okay, so, but that's what the ONH projection analysis does. So green then means a normal sector, red means an abnormal one. And you see they're not all the same shapes because the cluster and, and the relationship is not all the same. And here's an example case, the one we have before above. Um, we've already seen that. And now you see how that looks below. So the polar analysis shows just these two abnormal locations outside normal boundaries at the seven o'clock position. And you see a splinter hemorrhage and at the seven o'clock position in the uh, fundus image. And as well, you see uh, retinal ganglion cell loss at the same location in the OCT map killer map. And then when you look at the ONH projection analysis on the right, that's pointing exactly to that sector. Of course, you can do that in your head. It just may sometimes a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. And the red really draws your attention to where the issues are. Here's another example of a paracentral defect. You see how the cluster analysis and the polar analysis correspond to each other, just different orientation. And then you see the same type of result in your structural results. So let's move on to the next point um, for the remaining time of this talk, and that's the uh, progression analysis and how you can really speed up your clinical interpretation of glaucoma progression if you use progression analysis. We all know assessing visual field change is challenging. Is this stable this year? Is it progressing? Hard to say because, you know, these patients are not always so perfectly performing. You know, and the less reliable they are, the harder it gets. And then it comes, doesn't come as a surprise when you look at studies, expert agreements on visual field progression is very moderate, um, something between 45 and 65% agreement in studies. But there's a couple of studies about 10 years ago that they came out that really say if you use a progression software, you significantly increase um, agreement amongst the F, but you kind of standardize the way you look at patients. So that's why we have introduced this large suit um, of tools, the i -suite progression analysis that looks at defect location and depth, overall change or just fluctuation, distinguishes between diffuse and local change, looks at cluster change and also kind of answers where to look for structural change. So let's get started. Is this really changing or just fluctuation? How do we know? Um, in the ISV progression analysis, we use the mean defect um, to look at this because it summarized the visual field in a few words and it's been really shown to be the most robust index um, for for looking at visual field change. Um, in the Humphrey GPA, the visual field index is used, um, which is kind of nice to, to read because it is on a scale from zero to 100, but um, it's sometimes not so sensitive in early cases as some literature suggests. But anyway, it's the same thing. You take a global index and you track it. So you see here increasing at the bottom, um, a series of visual fields increasing, levels of defect, so increase, increasing mean defect over time. And you take these individual defects and you draw them 
in a two-dimensional scale on the time and um, the mean defect or mean deviation. You do that for all the fields. And then you draw this trend line. It's kind of a line, the red line, that's best connecting all the dots. You know, you can do that in your head. And if I asked you, how would you interpret that? You know, I mean, very simple, straight line stable, right, um, going down is worse than going up, it's improving. And we can do that if change is large enough, um, that's definitely good enough. Um, I get to that in a minute, um, how you can do this statistically or what you get in the octopus. But before we get to that, this trend line helps us to find something else and that's called the slope, you know, the slope or the steepness of that trend line, which is really just the rate of change over time. It answers the question, how much does this visual field series change in one year? So you look at one year and you see how much um, the, the mean defect changes. So here it's 1.9 decibel, which is quite fast. And you get this slope of 1.9 decibel. So that's just the speed of change. And it helps you to project into the future. It means in five years time, it's almost 10 decibel loss. In 10 years time, 20 decibel loss. So definitely calling for a heavy intervention. And now let's get back to this core question. Is this just fluctuation or is actually real change? And the more and the more unreliable your data, the harder to figure this out. You see here on the left, uh, you have a 0 0.9 decibel um, rate of change per year. On the right, it's, it's smaller. But the data, you can also visually see it, is much more consistent. And to really kind of use go beyond what we human beings can say, we use statistical methods for determining what's a significant change. And then the statistics we use, um, we kind of just translate them by showing this symbol if, if the changes or the worsening is significant, you see this red triangle downwards, or if it's not significant, we don't show anything. So really all you need to do um, to answer the question, is there change or not, as you look for these symbols. There's two levels of um, probabilities for worsening. So the filled um, downward arrow is a stronger um, certainty that this is real change. There, if there's no symbol, it means um, either this is a stable patient or you just don't have enough data. And Potentially, there could be worsening, for example, after a cataract removal, um, but I don't see that that often. So now it gets really simple and really quick. You just look at the visual field series. You look at the red, um, you look for the symbol, red down with arrow, okay, significant change. You look for the slope, how fast is it? Uh, here is 1.9 decibel a year, and you're done. Now, of course, um, things may get um, sometimes complicated. Um, so there are a couple of facts about this trend analysis. Um, and just to recap for users of Humphrey Perimeter, that's exactly what um, the VFI trend analysis does as well. So first of all, um, the number of tests influences the significance of change. The more tests we have, the better. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> you see, the more the data is fluctuating, the more tests we need. So here we don't have a significant change yet, but if we add more data, um, then we're actually able to find significant change. So that's one of you know that's one of the reasons for these rules um, have six visual field tests in the first two years because it just gives you a better chance to find change. Well, that's the first one. The second one is the more your data fluctuates, the harder it is to find change. You see this case with a relatively steep slope of 0.9 decibel a year, 
but statistically the change is not significant. And you see this much more reliable data set and it actually becomes significant. So it really pays working with your visual field technician um, to have good practice of performing the test. It will allow you to find progression much earlier. The other thing is also, um, you know, uh, unique good data. So if you have artifactual visual fields, unreliable fields in your analysis, it completely tips it over. This is a very extreme case, but actually a real one. On the very left, ptosis artifacts, um, fifth and sixth field, uh, super high false positives. So if you just put this into trend analysis, this actually looks like an improving series. If you remove the artifactual visual field loss, it becomes stable, you know, the process test. If you remove the other ones, only then you're actually seeing the real progression that's there. And this is something very important to do with trend analysis. And that's why I think it's really nice to network your computer, whatever you have, instead of working with paper, because you can always do this online, that kind of analysis. And the IC software, it's just a simple, click, you select the fields you want to have in your analysis. You don't need a baseline or anything. You just choose at least three you want to include, the more the better. And then this is calculated. And if you think a field is unreliable, you can even permanently um, um, turn it off. And, or, um, I mean, it's still going to be there, but it's kind of turned off, so it's not going to go into the analysis. OK, so very often, that's enough. Global change, yes, no. Um, but some cases are more tricky. Um, you know, we talked before about the causes of diffuse loss being either fluctuation or, or pathology. Um, and of course, um, diseases like glaucoma that we want to track with visual field um, testing, they're not diffuse. They're not creating diffuse loss most uh, most cases. So it's kind of more of complication to diffuse loss, right? For example, here's a case of a cataract patient with glaucoma. Um, and yeah, so which one is progressing? Um, may not always be easy. I mean, here I would say locally, there's for sure progression inferior nasally, but sometimes not so clear cut. Um, MD, of course, is progressing. The mean defect, mean deviation is progressing clearly, but you don't really know why. And the other instance is if you have a lot of fluctuation, and we talked about like, all this unreliable patient behavior, this, oh, I had a bad day, performance issues, um, they kind of lead to diffuse loss. And then it gets very hard to find real local progression, like in this case. Because here, the, the real clinical question is, is this glaucoma patient progressing or not? And you see the third field has a lot of diffuse loss. Um, MD, seems to be stable, at least it, there's no significant change, but you also see a lot of variability. Of course, I would e exclude that third field, just see how that changes the analysis. But there's two other things you can look at. Um, we have um, two tools, the diffuse defect and the local defect, um, which is really, um, don't necessarily need to understand these graphics um, that I have, but it's coming from the defect curve. That's how this is calculated. You can look it up in the visual field digest if you're interested. But it's basically taking the whole visual field and separating it into a diffuse and a local component. And then it, the reading um, about whether your field gets worse actually gets really easy and nice. So overall, yes, it's getting worse. Um, is there diffuse worsening? You just look at the red downward arrow on the DD progression. Yes, there is one. So yes, diffuse progression, cataract worsening. You look at the at the symbol on the LD, the local progression. Yes, there is also one. Um, and then you know already a lot. You know, okay, this is clear progression, and it's both diffuse and local. Um, there's also SLV progression. I don't use that. I mean, it's here for historic reason, because when you have both diffuse and local defects, both changing, it kind of gets a bit confused. Same thing where I find it's also helpful when you have a lot of fluctuation. You see MD change is not really picking. There's no, no significant change yet. Of course, you can add more data. 
But you look at the diffuse progression and you see exactly the same kind of fluctuation you have before. So you know, okay, there's something diffuse happening. So that's just been, the third field's been an unreliable one. But then when you look at the LD, you actually find significant change. So this glaucoma patient is worsening um, and you wouldn't have found that just with a global analysis. Again, um, SLV sometimes um, says the same thing. But it's just nice to distinguish between the two. And then we already introduced the cluster trend analysis. Um, this is an additional tool that really tells you where the change happens. It's easy to understand, that's why I like it. But it's also been shown to be more sensitive than MD trend analysis. I mean, not really surprising because, right, it's local. Um, but it's also more sensitive than an event analysis like you have, for example, in the size cheap in the Humphrey GPA in early glaucoma. But that's because, you know, it's local, but not too local. Because pointwise analysis is just so much um, influenced by poor patient performance on one day and not on the other, or small fixation losses. That's kind of harder to pick up change. Um, so there's a number of studies kind of really showing the power of this tool because it's also easy to read. I can really recommend you to try this. Um, and the cluster analysis is really nice if you want to see early change in just one cluster. It's also nice if you have a lot of fluctuation. You see here, okay, we know from the LD progression is local progression somewhere, but where? Not so clear. Right, patients not performing so well. We look at the cluster trend and things become much clearer. Um, and I find it's also very helpful in end stage disease, you know, where a lot of the visual field doesn't move anymore and it's get harder and harder to track progression in the remaining vision because, you know, here the superior visual field is uh, nearly dead. So this is, has a huge impact on the MD, on the mean DFME effect or deviation. Even though eyeballing this, I would say, okay, I think um, really there's something. But then I look at the cluster trend analysis and all these clusters that are kind of dead, um, they just have this black symbol that says, this is floor effect, but it allows you to track the remaining clusters. Also very helpful to um, look at um, the two paracetrous um, clusters in late stage glaucoma where you can still track them. And then just last, um, where the structural change happened, I introduced the polar analysis. We have um, the same thing for multiple fields, the polar trend analysis. Um, that just allows you to see where to look for structural change. This case here, you clearly see um, um, a lot of loss in the OCT and, and the polar trend analysis, you see exactly the same, you know, the same location where this happens. And the same logic that I explained to you before on the single field optic nerve head projection, of course, applies also for the trend. So you can see which cost, you know, which segment is their progression. And if you have something similar in your OCT, you can just put it side by side. So just let's just sum up once more, uh, because I think it takes a bit of practice to get into. Once you're into it, uh, you're really fast with this. Um, is there real change or just fluctuation? Look for the red symbol. If you find it is significant, how fast does it change? Look for the slope. Um, here it's just for 0.4 decibel a year. Um, is the change local or diffuse? In this case, it's local. Where does it happen? You see in the cluster and the polar trend analysis. And then you can easily link that to your structural result. And here's the second one. Real change, yes or no? Yes, because there's the red symbol. Um, how fast? A slope is 1.0 decibel a year. Is it diffuse or local? Well, it's not diffuse, but it's local. It happens paracentrally. And you can see you can see the infer temple, infer supra. Um, areas affected, you see this in the OCT as well. So this is what we offer on the octopus in terms of progression analysis. 
Um, a lot of useful tools um, in cases where you're not sure comes all on one page with one eye. Defect location and depth, real change or just fluctuation. Uh, is the change diffuse or local? Is there cluster change? And where should you look for structural change? So I thank you very much for your time and patience and, um, and for joining us today. Um, and now it is time for all the questions I've been seeing popping up uh, during my talk. Thank you, first of all, Monica, for this informative presentation and also bringing to us the latest things about uh, the Octopus software, the new cool features that we have in there. Um, I do have a couple of questions, um, but um, I would like to encourage all, the, um, all, all our audience to post more questions. I think we have some time to go through these questions together with Monica and the team. Um, I would start the um, question and answer session with some more formal question. Um, Monica, we have a couple of times people are asking, uh, is it possible to get copies of your slides. I know we do um, um, broadcast this video or this webinar um, and it will be available, but would you also be um, sharing your slides directly? I mean, I'm happy to do that. Um, the Visual Field Digest is intended to educate um, and it's for free and it's for everyone. Um, we also have a teaching kit. so. Um, a set of PowerPoints going, you know, giving you the right to use in your non-commercial uses. So that's on the Hawkstride website. Um, so that's, you can always access that anytime. Uh, if you'd like to get the slide deck, um, use the contact information. Um, one of my colleagues could put that once more into the chat. Um, you know, give me your name and whatever, tell me that you'd like that. So we have your email address and then I'm happy to share that um, for non-commercial purposes. Great, thanks. Um, then another question, um, I have an old Octopus 300. Is it possible to use these new art, uh, analytical tools on the Octopus 300? Yes, actually it is. Um, I think it's one of the nice things in a, the Octopus and the Octopus philosophy. You can basically hook up any Octopus um, you know, as long as you have the data, of course, electronically um, and export to iSuite and then you just get the latest analysis because we import your sensitivities, uh, your raw data, we have normative data for all the different devices. Also works for Humphrey parameters. You hook them up, you, um, you transferred your whole historic data and then we actually, you can recalculate all your data in the Octopus manner. So even your historic data captured on different devices um, you can use that. Okay, thanks a lot. Then um, more technical questions. Um, how do Octopus and Humphrey values compare? Um, is there some documentation for these comparisons? Yes, so I would uh, recommend you to read chapter 12. I think it's 12 on the Visual Field Digest. Um, it's called transitioning from one device to the other. I mean, it looks at what you have to consider when moving from one octopus to the other, but there's also a special section on what it means to move from a Humphrey parameter to an octopus. And there's these nice tables going through all these, all these different uh, representations and exactly kind of showing how they differ. And um, there's also literature re referenced. Um, so you can really find all the details there. Mm -hmm. Then another question regarding the diffuse loss. The seven in one printout shows the defect curve. At what point is it abnormal? Um, there's also a numeric value. When is that abnormal? Okay, so, I mean, the graphic as such, right? Um, I think that's a bit too broad to really base your diagnosis on it. I mean, as long as you're in that normal band, um, but fairly normal if you're outside of it, like strongly outside, you're clearly abnormal. Um, the DD value is, um, you know, we normalize that with our, our normative database and we have the same p-values on the probabilities that define boundaries. And then so if it's orange, it's kind of likely abnormal. If it's red, it gets very likely abnormal. So these these boundaries for these indices. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then there's another question. How do you monitor correct fixation? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting one on the octopus. I mean, we sometimes get asked, where's your gaze tracker? And the answer is we don't have one because we don't need one. Um, I mean, the, the way this works on an octopus is, um, well, we have a camera um, fixating the eye and we have a mechanism to detect the pupil. So if a patient blinks or looks away, um, the software noticed that, similar to the gaze tracker. But instead of just recording, oh, there's been something amiss here, what, or what we actually do is when, when we detect that, we stop testing. And when, you know, when it's just during a blink, a stimulus coming, repeat that stimulus. So what does this mean? It means that in the end, all the points have been tested or have actually been reliably tested, uh, at least in regards to fixation loss. I mean, there are the causes of unreliability. So, so yeah, you should get rid of fixation loss with uh, using the eye tracker or the fixation loss feature in the octopus because it really just measures when, when you fixate. Mm -hmm. okay. There's just another question came in. My octopus only does four to five false positive slash negative tests. Is it possible to increase it? Yeah, absolutely. You just go to um, the settings, um, the preferences, and then you can choose whatever you want in terms of how many false positives and negative answers do you want per test. Obviously, the more you have, the better statistics you have, but um, it also means the test takes a bit longer because you have more stimuli that are presented. So it's kind of a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Then there is another question more on the outlook for Octopus. Um, the question is, do you have future plans to, of, for using artificial intelligence, machine learning, or similar approaches for interpretation of visual field loss? Yeah, that's a very exciting question. So I'm going very close to my heart because that's something I'm personally involved with uh, working on. Uh, it's still very secret, uh, because it's very novel and unique, so I can't share details yet. Um, but you know, if you join us at a later such webinar, um, you may see something. Okay. Um, just checking if more questions are coming in. Um, there is one more. Um, you could you summarize uh, when you use the mentioned cluster analysis and when to use the polar analysis? Yeah. So you know, there's certain cases that are so clear cut uh, you don't need any of these advanced analysis features. You just look at the grayscale and you know everything's going on. Like certain hemianopias, um, it's just black and white. Um, I think where it gets really interesting um, is, is the tricky cases. I mean, clustering polar analysis is made for glaucoma. So not, it's not for all patients, but if you suspect glaucoma, it's borderline, you're not sure, um, that's when I would look at this. And, and it's really when you work with the software, it's, it's not really a choice you have to make um, because we have now views that include always um, these tools already. So you don't need to make a choice between the more traditional and the latest tools. You notice, I mean, there, we, the seven in printout has been around forever, but we have a user defined printout that allows you to add more and then you can just have them as in your standard view. And that's the way I'm working, you know, because why should I flip around in a software if I can have everything on one page? Okay, great. So, I do not have any further questions for the moment, and we are also at the end of our time. So I would propose that we end our session for today, uh, which gives me uh, the chance to really thank, first of all, Monica for her excellent presentation, um, for bringing um, the octopus and perimetry as such nearer to us. Thank you, Monica, for that. But I would also like, uh, like to take the opportunity to thank you, our valued audience for your particip participation, for taking the time uh, to be with us. We really hope that you could get some information out of this. If this presentation sparked off your interest for more, as I mentioned before, we will have a series of webinars throughout this month. So we call it the Parametry Focus Month. So please check out our website or the link that we have been posting in the chat box for more of these webinars. 
certainly also our website might be a good um, address for resources on that topic. Um, now, before we end, we will uh, send you also a short poll and we would kindly ask you for some feedback about this webinar. Please give us your feedback, we would appreciate it so that we can always improve. Well, thanks again for taking your time. Thanks again for being with us. And I hand over to Monica to address the last words to the audience. Well, yes, uh, yeah, it was great uh, having so many people joining today. Um, just somebody ask once more for the contact information. So my colleague could please once more post it to the chat. Um, it was great having you here. Um, I hope maybe to see some of us, uh, some of you in um, more sessions coming up. Um, I'll be involved in quite a number of them. Um, so see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day and hope to see you around soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.